Christmas boat. Now she said, she... yeah, Heather is very knowledgeable and very good at getting over her knowledge in a clear way as well. Um, and although tonight it's about growing native plants possibly in your garden, I think quite a lot of us would go for that, even though we go outside to look for our plants. I'm, I'm certainly trying to grow native plants in my garden with different successes. <laughs> um, so I shall just throw the screen open to Heather. Right, and I'm now proposing them. to share the screen. I hope it will work, will it? I've lost it. Goodness, where is it? Oh, there we are. Right. Hold on then. Um, we'll be the top. Right. Oops, it's not working. Sorry, folks. There we are. Are people now seeing the whole thing full screen? Yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, I've got a row of people down one side, and I'm going to actually minimise them. I've got a bit that says more. Is that where I minimise? Oh, it doesn't matter. I know what it says anyway. Um, I hope you can see the picture nicely. Right, folks, I want to talk about really my experiences of trying to grow plants in the garden that are native. Often I grow them just because I think they're really, really attractive. And I think it's because I don't like things that are too big and too bold necessarily, I think there's a subtlety and a sort of small scale beauty about a lot of our native things that um, is, is what I like. So here, for example, we have some alliums and um, it's our wild native garlic. And yes, there's loads and loads of alliums you can get. And admittedly, I have got some with huge, great big pink flowers. There's always two sides of me. One of me wants a beautiful garden with straight box hedges and all wonderful flowers. And the other part of me likes these, um, well, less less bright objects. But I must admit, they're totally intermixed in my garden and I quite like the mixture. And I'm always tinkering with it, of course, to try and add something else. When people talk about growing wildflowers, I think very often they think about growing native species uh, and annuals at that. And you can get these annual seed mixes. This is a very exotic annual seed mix. It is actually all Scottish. Uh, it's got a few rather rare little things in there, like that thing that, whose name I've forgotten. But there's a corn marigold, corn flower, a corn flower, corn poppy. Uh, there should be the prickly poppy somewhere in there. It's all seed collected in Scotland. And it, uh, annual flowers can give a stunning display while they're actually flowering. But you must remember that annuals really just want to flower and set seed and die. So they don't necessarily have a very long flowering season. And you could actually say that for quite a few of our natives, even the perennials, because what we tend to have in our gardens are often things that are based on native plants, but we have a selected form. And I don't really go very much for annuals. Uh, there's not a lot of space in the garden for annuals anyway. One that I do have that sort of rumbles around my vegetable garden is this hemp nettle. There are three species. This is one which is not wildly common, but you might have seen it around, uh, and it's speciosa. It's, it's a gorgeous thing. It has this really rather more purpley than blue lip, and I love it. And it keeps popping up in the wrong place, and I keep transplanting off among the runner beans or somewhere where I would rather have it. And... Um, and that's the way I tend to grow annuals. If one poppy comes up in a good place, I leave it. And if it comes up somewhere where I don't particularly want it, because it'll squash all the onions or something, then it just comes out. So if you're like me, you, you might see plants out in the wild and you think, oh, that's lovely. Wouldn't that be nice in my garden? And, and I think all gardeners are like that in other people's gardens as well. You see it and you go, oh, I want that. And gardeners are notorious for wanting things that other people have. This is a meadow near Kondrogan Field Centre where I used to go. It's valerian and meadow sweet and these lovely um, melancholy thistles. I tried meadow sweet, but my garden was too dry and it got mildew. I haven't even tried valerian. I did try the melancholy thistle. The trouble is it has these spreading runners and it spreads like nothing on earth. It grows very tall because it's growing in garden soil, which is nothing like 
where it would be growing if it was out in the wild. So it gets big and it falls over. And I tend not to even grow proper garden plants that get big and fall over. I like small ones that don't fall over. And it, it's really just too big. You need to give it an awful lot of space. So there are some things I just resolve to enjoy when they're out, I'm out and about and I see them on the verge. And actually on road verges, it often gets cut and then comes up again small. And you might think, well, it's not very big, but mm, try it in my garden and it's it's not a wild success. There are other things that have been accidentally introduced from plant hunters that have gone all over the world and brought things back. And this is Him Himalayan or Indian balsam, if you like. Uh, Policeman's helmets is one of the names for these amazing flowers. And it's got these wonderful, wonderful pods that when you even touch them or squeeze them, they explode in your hand. And, and they're terrific fun. But it, it's huge. It's the biggest annual that we have in Britain. It can get well over two metres high. And it's an absolute menace. And anyone involved in conservation, I'm sure, will know that it's just not something that you want anywhere near and native plants or any plants. It just squashes them out. And it's, it's not a very good idea, really. But you can see why people thought they were good in the first place. I always remember on a trip, I was showing people how these seeds explode like that. And somebody was trying to put some in her pocket to take home to show her husband. But every time she picked them, of course, they just exploded. So it didn't work. Another thing which people probably think is native, and you wouldn't, obviously, and it might not be a problem where you are, but it's this uh, wild garlic. And when you say wild garlic, people are often thinking of this one because all around Edinburgh, this is the one which chokes up our river valleys and is all over the place. And it's Allium paradoxum, it's not native. Few flowered leek is one of its common names. You're lucky if you get one flower. The rest of its, its sort of um, flower head is occupied by these little bulbs. And the stems of it are, um, well, a foot high, say, and then it sort of falls over sideways. And that spreads at a foot to one side because all these little bulbs get shed and it gets caught up in people's treads of their feet. And it's, it's just such a pest. And it's popped up in my garden, whether it's from feet that have been wandering around the areas where it grows or if the birds bring it, I don't know, but it's certainly very common all around Edinburgh and, and not an awfully good thing to have. It's not even all that wildly attractive. I suppose that actual flower is quite nice, but you can eat it. And that's actually what I tend to do now. Every time I see any in the garden, I just tweak it out and it tastes very good. So we come back to the first picture I had, which was of the wild garlic, which I think is lovely. It's beautiful. It's every bit as good as some of the ones that people plant. And it's nothing like so invasive. You can see just at the front of the photograph, actually there's a different photo from the first one. Uh, this isn't in my garden. That's this few flowered leek with loads and loads of horrible little bristly bulbs there. And I know in a place near Edinburgh, where you've got the wild garlic right down in the valley and you've got this alien one spreading in from the top. The alien one seems to be winning somehow or other. Uh, it just chokes out the other one, which is very sad. So try not to grow the wrong one. And um, I'm sure you wouldn't make that mistake. And with any luck, you haven't got it, but I don't know. Let me know if you've got it. Any nods or shakes of heads, no? Yes, no. Um, so it comes down to very simple little flowers, which I absolutely love. They're, they're spring flowers, so they need to um, grow quite early in the year, which is lovely. I love just the ordinary wild primrose, and I think you can go a long way to get something better. It's a very delicate little colour, beautifully scented. You can buy, I notice they're selling in garden centres now, things that look a bit like them. It's the colouring almost, is sometimes a bit brighter but somehow the flowers are an awful lot bigger and it doesn't need to be big. It's just a delicate little gorgeous wee thing. And in my garden, it'll just seed itself anywhere, very happy, very obliging. And um, ideally it would grow slightly more shaded, I think. My garden has very light soil, which affects what I can grow. But um, that is a very successful thing to grow. The only snag is it will hybridize with coloured ones. And although I don't have many colour primulas, I've got the little wonder, purple one, if anyone knows it, 
and so you end up with the dirty pink, which I'm afraid gets sort of edited out. Um, but also, wooden enemy, I really like that. That one you do need to be a bit careful with, because I was growing it out in the open, and it just grew into something far, far too vigorous and dense and choked out other things. Whereas if you grow it under a bush, it flowers more and it seems much happier. And that's very easy to grow from seed. Uh, so is the primrose as well. Um, make sure you get a, a variety of um, seed from different plants, particularly with the primrose, because at the Botanic Garden, they wanted to have a reintroduction scheme for one of the little glens near Edinburgh where the Victorians had dug it all out. And they collected off several individuals, but only the seed from one plant grew. And all the plants that grew from it, um, I don't know if you know that primulas, if you look inside the flower, um, they can either be self-fertilizing or cross-fertilizing. And somehow or other, all the plants that they managed to grow were um, self-fertilizing, uh, so wait a minute, cross-fertilizing. And if you didn't have anything to cross with them, you would have a problem. So anyway, just all, always and always, if you're collecting seed, and I think it's quite legitimate to collect something that's very, very common, growing, say, at the side of a road where it's going to get run over or something anyway, um, I think that would be fine. But do get from several individuals. And celandine. Now, I have mixed feelings about celandine, partly because I suspect that what you have round about you will be the diploid one that has two sets of chromosomes. That is the wild one, which you get when you're well away from what you might call civilization. Not that I'm implying you're not civilized, but anywhere cultivated where you get lots of people, you tend to get the one which I have in my garden. And that one has four sets of chromosomes. And the way you can tell very easily, if it's the diploid one with two sets, it's quite a low, short thing. If it's the tetraploid one, it has quite long spreading stems. And if you look in the axles of the leaves, you'll see little bulbils. And the ones in my garden, when they come up to begin with, you think, oh, lovely, celandines flowering, spring is coming. And then the plants get bigger and bigger and taller and taller, and they kind of flop sideways. And as they flop sideways, of course, these little bulbils get spread. And it does mean it can spread very fast. Um, so ideally you would have the diploid one, but um, you might not have much choice depending on what you've got around you. And it does grow from little, um, what would you call them? I'm calling these bulbs, but things that are under the ground, uh, little sort of corn-like looking objects. Uh, and it dies down, all dies down, and then you forget about it till the next year anyway. But these woodlandy ones that I was referring to, they're great in under bushes before the leaves come along. And that's the ideal condition for them. And then once you've got your bushes and they've come out and it's very shaded and not much will grow there, then that's fine. Um, they've done their, their bit. Other terribly common things that I like are foxgloves. I think foxgloves are great. Um, it's just a wee corner of the church garden where nothing much was growing and we just tucked some in temporarily. One snag again in the garden is they will get very big and fall over. But they do sell a variety called Foxy, which is exactly like the native one. I mean, it is the native one. It's just a selected form. And it'll get maximum about five feet. And that, that's very handy, actually. And, um, OK, they, they can get big. And if it's very windy, they'll blow over. But um, if you're fairly speedy, about cutting off that whole flower spike, it will produce a whole lot more from the side and you can prolong the season on quite a long way. And I think foxgloves are stunning. If it was really rare, you would think it was something wonderful. Going a bit sort of smaller scale now, there's bugle or a juga, and this is just a wild one with green leaves and the lovely wee blue flowers. This Again, you can get garden forms, and there's a really nice one with dark purplish leaves, which I very much like, and I have a lot of. And you have this purple leaf with the blue flowers, and it looks great. And for wildlife purposes, they're good little flowers, good source of nectar, and it doesn't really matter what colour the leaves are. So this is where you can have a combination of a more selected garden form with all, all the beauty of, of the native one, really. 
but if you just want the native one, it's fairly shallow rooted, doesn't make an outstanding nuisance of itself. And um, I, I like bugle. Also ground ivy, which is a funny sort of name because okay, it grows on the ground, but the only ivy bit is it has creeping stems, again, very shallow rooted. And the creeping stems, the leaves on it look a bit like ivy. But it's the gorgeous little blue flower around that is the most stunning little blue spike. I mean, a lot of these are very small. You might have to get down there to appreciate it properly. But I think these are just every bit as lovely as, as a lot of the garden things that you would get. And both of these, uh, not much use me pointing, sorry. Both of these are good for um, woodland, shady sort of areas. I've got them up near a north wall. And they're very, very happy. Now, this is something you might want to think twice about. You'll see my fingers at the bottom of the screen there, maybe, uh, pulling back the leaves. It's very easy to miss the flowers on this arrow. Uh, they're amazing flowers, astonishing looking things. They look very exotic. And uh, the only thing you do have to be careful of if you've got grandchildren is that it does produce great clusters of red berries later on. And um, because of that, for years now, I've just gone out and pulled them out because of my great nieces and nephews. Um, and I mean, you can tell them and they probably would have the sense not to eat them. And our lot are a bit suspicious about what they eat anyway in the fruit line. But um, it, it, that would be something to watch out for. But really, these are amazing flowers. And um, that's something I, I do have again under distant dark bushes and it will take a lot of shade. Now, woodruff is something which they often recommend when you read about, you know, wildflowers to grow in your garden. It's perennial, it's very pretty, it's scented, but goodness, it spreads. I had it completely take over my little front garden and um, I, with great effort, I've just about managed to get rid of it. There, there's a few areas now where I let it grow uh, around in the back garden. I do like it and it's very pretty, but um, a lot of these things, it can just be a bit much. It is shallow rooted. That's one of the redeeming features. You get your fork underneath and sort of rip it up. But when it flowers, it's very nice. And it is a sweet little thing. Something I haven't had, and every time I see it when I'm out and about, you think, oh, isn't that beautiful? Lovely blue vetch. I'm assuming I've got the right photograph here for tufted vetch. And it's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It looks lovely going up a hedge. But all the vetches, um, well, nearly all, are perennial. And the roots go way, way down. I've got a little one, uh, something or other, Sepium. It's its first name, I can't remember. And and it, uh, it came all by itself. I know there's some in the neighbourhood. And I cannot get rid of it. It's got these deep, deep roots. And it would just choke other things. So there are some things it's probably not worth getting involved with. Unless you've got the space. And unless you've got the kind of garden where you do just want lovely great rafts of things growing over the hedges and so forth. But um, I'm, I'm trying to walk this line between having a reasonably tidy sort of garden garden and um, I'm afraid the wild things have to sort of fit in a bit. So here's a bit of my garden then. Uh, the house is away over here, few flats next door. Um, Forget-me-nots, I love forget-me-nots. Forget-me-nots are one of the nicest things in my garden. And um, it's, it's almost a weed, it's so abundant. It fills up every single vacant space in the spring. And it's so obliging. It just comes up, it flowers its socks off. After a while, it begins to get mildew and looks a bit tatty. And then I just pull it off. And as I pull it off, it drops a whole lot of seed for next year. And then you just go around in a circle. It, um, it's very shallow rooted, so very easy to pull out again. And um, I... What I'd quite like to have, although it's probably a bit late because it's all over the place now, is to have a more compact variety. You can get ones that are shorter and a deeper blue. It's possible they wouldn't be quite so vigorous and they might not establish and reseed so happily. But forget-me-nots, I think, are really, really good value. And they are an example of something which really is not very far removed, um, the ones that people grow in their gardens from just the plain wild form. And it just gives you this lovely little blue fuzz just sort of going all over the vegetables, 
gets yanked out a bit there. Um, but I like it. Some GM there, which is obviously a, a, a cultivated one. But so many of our flowers that we have, obviously they are native somewhere in the world. A lot of them are native in this country. And I tend to go for a single flowered forms because there's the ones that have lots of nectar. So it doesn't have to be wildflowers, remember. Um, anything that is good for wildlife and has the colours that I want is, is well worth having. Now, grassland is something I find very difficult. I love the idea of lovely long grass, beautiful meadow covered in cowslips, and there's some crossword here, it's an abbey in England. And um, I, I really aspire to having a bit of grassland. But I think you probably need quite a decent sized space to get it going very well. And also, I hadn't realised how shaded my garden is. You, you feel it's fairly open in parts, but I think to have a really good going grassland, you do want a decent sized space. I tried cowslips in my grass quite a few times, and I don't think it suits my soil too well. Ripwork planting, I think, is beautiful. I mean, look at these wonderful little stamens making a gorgeous little sort of circle and then the female flowers going on up here. I, I think it's just a stunning wee thing. Um, and it's an example of something that grows in grassland. is It's utterly common and a real weed, but um, it's, it's really very attractive. But I do think you need a decent amount of space to grow something like that. And things always seem to want to grow much better in the, like the empty bits of vegetable garden than, than obviously in among the competition among grass. And that, that is always a bit of a problem in gardens. You can't have a bare bit of gravel because it makes a perfect seed bed. And it's not bad if it's the things going into the seed bed that you really want, but it doesn't always work that way. Yarrow I like, um, that's another grassland uh, species. What I forgot to take a photograph of is that this year I had some, oh, sorry, last year, I had some seed of um, different colours of shades of pink, which were very, very successful. And I've grown in a really dry bit of soil. And I chose a variety that wasn't supposed to get too tall so it wouldn't get big and fall over. And that's another example of how to grow native things, but still have them um, in a more garden kind of form but you still have all the pollen and all the nectar available. Red campion, I like. That's a good thing for, um, well, almost anywhere in the garden, actually. My plants move around, and it's good when you can let plants do that, because I think often they might you know, rather exhaust the soil where they are, and, and then they seed themselves off somewhere else, and they do really well there for a while. And, and that's a good thing if you can let any of your native plants do that. I find the plants, although it's perennial, they're a bit short-lived. And, and that's fine, I don't mind, because they pop up here and they pop up there. And if I don't want them to pop up, well, they just pop out. So uh, it's, it's not invasive, it's not a nuisance. And um, I like it. I wish they wouldn't call it red campion. I think pink campion's a better name for it, anyway. And you know that you have the separate males and females. There's your little female stigmas and stigmata and uh, the little male stamens in there. So if you've only got one plant, you might have a bit of a problem getting seed another year. Ladies' bed straw. This is another one which, again, when I see it in a sand dune and it's all short and beautiful, I think, oh, isn't that nice? I really like that one. And I do have it now. And it is growing quite well, but I do cut it back as soon as it's finished flowering. And in fact, I yank back the shoots a bit because it just wants to sort of creep off and take over the space it's in. And I've got some other things there. But um, I, I, I tend not to leave things alone. I always want to sort of tinker with them, do something with them and just modify them a wee bit. I tried Ragged Robin. But my garden's not damp enough. Even the edge of the pond, it doesn't do very well. And there's a few things I just keep trying and failing with. Now, this is something, globe flower, Trollius europaeus, which when I see it up in the mountains, um, not very often, I always think, oh, that's so special. And I mean, maybe you people see it all the time and you're more fortunate than further north. But to me, it's, it's very special. 
I'm surprised to find it just grows in the garden in an ordinary border without any apparent difficulty at all. It doesn't need to seem to have a rather damp meadow, which seems to be more its habitat when it's up in the mountains. Um, I don't know how it does as well as it does, really. But you get these beautiful pale lemony yellow flowers, absolutely gorgeous, and I really, really like them. And this is an example of something which I think of as, as being quite special. I mean, it's not totally rare or anything, but uh, often you might find the leaves because something's eaten the flowers. So in the garden, hopefully you don't have that problem. But um, that one I found a remarkably easy thing to grow. The problem, of course, is buying something that's not orange or, or some strange colour. Uh, I think I did just buy that, though. It was just a, it was just a pale lemony one. Um, now, still talking about meadows and grassland and so forth. We went years ago on our trip to Northern Ireland to look at some orchids, and they took us to see the grassland at uh, is it Stormont, where they have their parliament. And here's the grassland. They sowed it up, all sorts of different species. And as nearly always happens in grassland, mostly it's grass and the flowering plants just kind of, they hardly see them really. And the grass can get a bit vigorous and choke them out. Now, there's a thing which they always recommend for conservation purposes that you can use when you're trying to grow things, especially native plants altogether, and it's yellow rattle. It's called that, as you probably know, because it has these big seed pods, and when the seeds are ripe, you can sort of shake it around and it rattles. It's a very nice wee yellow flower, quite pretty, and it's a hemiparasite. So it's got green leaves, and it's got nice shoots above ground, but below ground, it's plugged in to other plants. So if you were to sow some, it's probably possibly a bit late this year, but maybe not, um, you can buy seed from somewhere like Scotia Seed that are very good at doing native plants. And if you're going to sow it, like we sowed some for the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh, you get a hand for it and you sort of scratch away at the ground and get down to some bare soil on, on the grassland. And you put the seed on just a wee sprinkle and stand on it or pat it down or something. So the seed's actually touching the ground. And then during the winter, that seed will send out a kind of root, postorium it's called, and, and plug itself into well, anything really. It's usually the grass because there's that's what there's most of. But um, it plugs itself in and it means that the grass itself is reduced in size. And in fact, anything it plugs itself into is reduced in size. So it, it just makes it less vigorous. So the yellow that you're seeing fairly abundantly around there, that's yellow rattle. And you'll see the height of the grass coming along and then it suddenly sort of dives down a bit when you get to where the yellow rattle's going and then it goes up again. And it can be quite a dramatic effect. And once you've got the yellow rattle making the grass less vigorous, other species will do well as well. I mean, the other species might also have the yellow rattle plugging itself in, but it doesn't matter because it gives you a much better species diversity. So if you were thinking about having a, a nice little area of grass and getting it a bit more varied and interesting and having other species in there, you might want to be thinking about introducing some yellow rattle seed. It's a native anyway, it's, it's a nice looking plant anyway. And uh, you can see much more buttercups and things in there. So um, that's something you could do with long grass. I did have it in my shorter grass last year, but I can record it doesn't much like being cut by the mower. And of course, you're cutting its flowers off, which is not totally handy. And even cutting half a flower spike, the rest of the flower spike doesn't like it much. So what I'm trying to do in my garden um, I've not got a big lawn, but I've got lots of grass paths and I, I kind of need them to get around. And um, I'm, I'm trying to encourage my grass. This is not my grass, it's somewhere else. I thought, wow, wish my garden was like that. You can see it's got some of that little, um, not this name, thing that grows in walls. You know what I mean? Toad flux or something, I believe, toad flux. Um, that, that was sort of creeping along because there was a wall just dropping down in front here. Um, loads of lovely daisies. I do like daisies. 
I was quite pleased that one of my nieces asked for daisies, asked for some daisies to plant in her lawn. And then she proudly reports that she's got two whole plants, so hopefully they'll seed themselves around. So this is very much work in progress. Anything I plant in my garden gets sort of audited by the badgers and the foxes and the squirrels. And the badgers, well, particularly the foxes, will dig things up to see what you've been planting. And I find that a bit of an impediment, I have to say. Um, the bulbous buttercup I've got, um, which is to me just that wee bit special because it's not nearly so common. It's supposed to be an indicator of ancient grassland, but I'm cheating because I planted it. Somebody at work gave me some plants actually, um, and I put them in. Got these lovely little recurved sepals, so that you know what it is. That's good because it is a clumpy buttercup and it's not a creeping one like the creeping buttercup, which is in my lawn as well. And the creeping buttercup is quite short and it doesn't mind being cut by the mower. But if I've got time, I'm afraid I do rather crawl around and dig it out because I'd rather just have the bulbous one. And that's slowly spreading, which is great. Um, this Veronica, I think it's beautiful. I think it's ever so sweet. It's not native, I don't think, but I love it. And it pops up in the grass and I think it looks nice. And it fits in with my idea of having a sort of mini meadow about two inches high. The bird's foot trefoil, I've just about got established. This is not flowering in my grass. Um, I had awful trouble when I get the side with the fox trying to dig things out. Uh, in the end, when I planted things, I pegged down a wee bit of wire netting over the top of it. And that um, seemed to fox it for a while. Well, yeah, so I put it off for a while. And then um, I just took the wire netting off later and it was okay. Selfield does quite well. I haven't got a photograph of it, sorry, but um, that makes nice little low spreading carpets in the grass. Doesn't mind being trodden on, doesn't mind being mowed. So the, the bulbous buttercup, I tend to mow around. That's quite a short flowering season. But um, I have this vision of my grass, so you know, packed with all these lovely little flowers, which um, would be rather nice. I've also got some um, euphrasia, you know, the, um, the eye bright as well although that's an annual, um, and it came up last year, so I'm hoping it's going to pop up again this coming year. And that's another thing, it's very short, and, and you can set the mower height. I do cut it very infrequently, um, so that you just take off the top of the grass and stop the grass seeding. Um, we, we've been having really, really dry, well, springs and good part of the summer some years, and two years ago, I really only cut the grass about four times in the whole summer. It was so dry. And the snag with that was I found that the grass set seed and I got an awful lot of grass coming up elsewhere, which I decided I wouldn't let it do that. And I would try and cut the grass heads off. I mean, you might decide you want the grass. It just depends what you want and where you want it. Another thing which has done surprisingly well in the grass, and this is in my lawn, is the little sweet violets. Uh, odorata and that seems quite obliging about growing in little cracks in the rock and in the, my little rock garden and, and in the grass itself. Um, I tried just having the ordinary wild uh, dog violet I, and the idea of having violets and primroses appealed to me but you just seem to get tons and tons of rosettes and not very many flowers whereas this one has lots of flower and I like that one better. So that, that's the one that I've ended up encouraging more. So moving on to what you might call woodland, uh, I do have a fair bit of honeysuckle. Honeysuckle is a wild plant, although there are lots of well different species and cultivars that you can buy, but always they have this long pollen tube and um, it's great for things like long tongue moths and things like that. So I like it, I love the scent. I think it's very attractive, it's a good climber, and it's good for wildlife. And of course, all these native species that I grow, because they're native, they are good for wildlife. Ivy is another one. <laughs> I have very mixed feelings about ivy. Ivy can suck all the moisture out of the ground, especially when you're having a drought. And I've, I've limited where I have it. It used to be right down one border over the wall, but it made the whole border terribly dry. So now it's actually growing through my beach hedge. There's a lot of it, 
it flowers very profusely. And then um, um, although it gets trimmed in with a beach head, you still get plenty of flower and lots of berries. The wood pigeons spend happy hours eating these berries. And at least it, well, it keeps them occupied, but um, an awful lot of wood pigeons. Just a Sue laughing there. But um, I'm sure there's some other birds when things must come and eat them. But what is interesting is the things that live on the, or not live on, the, the nectar that they get from the flowers. And this year, for the first, oh, sorry, last year, <laughs> for the first time, I saw the holly blue butterfly. And uh, I don't know if you know about the holly blue butterfly. It's one of the examples of a butterfly which is moving further north because of climate change. Don't know if it's quite made it to Inverness yet, but you never know. And it has this extraordinary life cycle. And I hope I'm going to tell you the right way around. Uh, in the spring, the caterpillars hatch out on holly and they eat the holly flowers in particular, and presumably young holly leaves. And then shortly afterwards, they pupate. And quite early in the year, before you get any other blue butterflies, I'd say about May, June, but I might be misremembering, you get this very pale blue little butterfly flapping around the garden. You think, goodness, what's that? And then that one, because it's called the holly blue, um, it started off on the holly, but it goes off and lays its eggs on the ivy. And then by the time they've hatched out, you've got nice young buds and, and flowers coming out on the ivy. So it feeds up on that, then it pupates, and when it comes out in the spring, it goes off and lays its next lot of eggs on the holly. So it's a funny holly and ivy sort of um, butterfly. I was very pleased to have that. And certainly in our area, there's lots of holly, lots of ivy. So um, it's nice to feel that uh, it's providing that very specific habitat. As I say, it's also good for loads of flies and all sorts of things you see uh, on the flowers. And loads of happy wood pigeons. Another thing which is already beginning to root their catkins and look very conspicuous, though they won't be actually flowering yet, is hazel. Uh, hazel's great for early pollen. Loads and loads of pollen produced. It's wind pollinated, so that means it has to produce a lot of pollen. So it's very popular with the bees, as would willow be. Um, willows in general can be a bit big, but there's... There are smaller species if you want to have them. Um, that's the female flowers, and normally the wind would just blow the pollen, but uh, it does mean that there's just copious quantities of pollen there. And it is good to have these pollen sources, like the holly and, and the hazel, available somewhat out of season. It's good for the bees if they can come out, if you get any milder spells, and um, there's some food waiting for them. Now, blackthorn is another disaster I want to report. You see blackthorn growing outside and you think, oh, isn't that lovely? Oh, I'd like to have that. Look, there's a nice wee bush. Wouldn't I like a nice wee bush like that in my garden? And um, the trouble with blackthorn is it's suckers. And I had some blackthorn and yes, it's ever so pretty and I did like it. But I have to say it doesn't flower for all that long, but it then sends out these suckers and suckers and suckers and it just spreads. And if you've got lots of room, it's great. But um, I had it in a rather small front garden, my little front garden. At one point, it was supposed to be all native. And um, dear me, it's, it's really not that easy to manage. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't recommend that one. You want something a wee bit sort of tamer that stays in one place. I'm all for clumpy things all the time. Things that creep are just not always so desirable. But um, it's lovely, it has berries, it has flowers, it has nectar, it has everything, but it's suckers. Now, all right for time, am I? You're not all getting bored and all people I can see are still wide awake, so that's lovely, thank you. Um, rock gardens, this, this actually is not a native at all. This is an idea which I saw at work at the Botanic Garden, and I thought, hey, what a good idea, because you tend to think with rock gardens you've got to have great big rocks all sort of layered going up and down the way, but actually you can put them on their sides. And then you get a nice deep root run, but you get somewhere to keep the crown uh, nice and dry. And uh, yet the roots can still get down. 
Um, I said that I haven't actually got around to doing it yet, but if anybody wants that idea, there it is. This is an example of the purple mountain saxifrage of something which they do actually even sell in garden centres. And to me, it's a bit special because you have to be out really early on the hills to see it, quite early flowering. And um, it likes a wee bit of limestone, I think, doesn't it? So it's, it's not the sort of habitat that you're wandering around all the time. And yet, actually, it's, it's a remarkably almost easy thing to grow in the garden. So somewhere like a trough would be a really good place to put something like this, or a rather small bit of rock garden. And the, the trouble is some of the rarer things which you can grow is how you get hold of them. Um, but this one, as I say, you can actually buy. And you people are lucky enough to have hard fern, uh, where they do sell quite a few native alpine kind of things. Another one, which uh, this is actually in the rock garden at uh, the Botanic Garden again, is the sticky catch fly. It's called sticky because the stem is, is a bit sticky. And I think the idea is that if anything's crawling up there to eat the seeds, it's going to stick to the stem. But it's, it's very pretty. Um, it used to be called Silene, and then now I notice it's just called, uh, sorry, it used to be called Viscaria, now it's Silene. Uh, so it's, it's just one of the campions, really, but not desperately common. Uh, it grows on Arthur's Seat in the middle of Edinburgh and various other places with dry, sunny rocks. And it's so, it's so easy to grow in the garden. And... Um, it's one of these things that in the wild, it seems to want a nice open, sunny sort of rock face where you'd think it would dry up too much. But if you get too much tree cover coming over the top of it, it will just shade out altogether. But in the garden, give it, well, not, don't give it space. It just helps itself, really. And this is a sort of classic thing for seeding itself into gravel. Um, sunny gravel, just what it likes. Sunny gravel seems to appeal to quite a lot of things. And if anyone wants seeds, I didn't collect any this year, but I can certainly collect some next year. And um, it's a lovely wee thing. So there's quite a few native species which are reasonably easy to grow. The, the mossy saxifrage, you can buy just a plain white one, um, which is often slightly more vigorous than the native one. The native one seems to grow in drippy, wet flushies. And you might think, oh dear, how can I have a drippy, wet flush? But actually, I find it just grows, just grows in garden soil, which seems a bit extraordinary. The rock rose, you think, oh, you know, all these lovely lime-rich places where it grows. Again, it's very obliging. Um, I find if you buy rock rose, uh, the cultivated ones that they sell, they often seem to be more vigorous with great big flowers. I mean, you can get sort of bright pink ones and all sorts. I like this nice pale yellow little one, which is our native one. And um, it doesn't get so big either. One thing I was really interested in in mine, I've got quite a spreading patch in a dry, sunny corner that's a bit awkward, but that's growing really well there. I hadn't noticed in the wild, it only seems to flower in the morning. And then um, you come back and it's dropped all its petals. And perhaps that's just, um, well, I suppose you climb up the hill and you get there and you see it and then you go off somewhere else. Maybe that's how I never noticed. Or perhaps it lasts longer at higher altitude, I don't know. The bloody crane's bill, geranium sanguinium. I always think that's an unfortunate name. This is not quite as deep purpley pink as it should be, actually. That is one of the most obliging, useful garden plants that I know. It will grow practically anywhere. It doesn't seem to mind shade. I've got an awkward bit under an apple tree. And that has this great mound of beautiful, well-flowering clump with very nice little leaves. Every year I just cut it right down. Every year it comes up again. And um, in the wild it would grow on dry, sunny rock faces. Um, and it's, it's a nice thing. It doesn't get too big. Uh, it can seed itself a lot, but you can always just dig out the seedlings. It's one that you get in a lot of different varieties that they sell as garden varieties. Like you can get a paler pink one, you can get one uh, with strong veining. And, and it's, it's lovely, actually. I like it very much. The Scottish bluebell or um, Campanula rotundifolia or whatever you want to call it, the harebell, 
I was always brought up to grow it with, uh, to call it with my English mother. I love it. I love it. And I want to grow it. But I can't because the slugs just keep eating it. And it's very sad. So I'm afraid I've failed on that. I've grown it from seed several times. I can keep it under sort of strict control in the cold frame. But the minute it goes out in the garden, it just disappears. But maybe other people don't have as much problem as I do. I don't know. But it's a bit of a pest. Um, but I'd like to have that. I think it would be very nice. I don't think it would get too big, and I don't think it would do anything badly behaved. Who knows? Now, this is probably one of my favourite plants of all, and it's thrift. And it is so obliging. It flowers its socks off. It really flowers so abundantly. You deadhead it, and you get another flush. You deadhead it, and you get another flush. So if you bother to cut all the flowers off when they're finished flowering, it will give you three lots in a season, which to me is exceedingly good value. And I love it. What I haven't got, uh, I mean, this is actually a garden form, which is a wee bit deeper than your native one. And if you look at wild populations, they vary subtly. You know, there's a paler pink and slightly darker pink ones. And I would like that. But um, I suppose if I collected some seed, it might conceivably work. But I just love it. I think it's so good. If you don't cut the flowers off, it will actually seed itself as well. And it's not too big. It does get things eating the roots a wee bit sometimes. You suddenly find you've got a little dead tussock where you just pull it out and the rest of it grows in to fill up the space. You see my abundant forget-me-not sort of romping away around the back there. And um, that that is just such good value. I think it's an excellent thing. Uh, stone crop, I like stone crop, yellow stone crop. It smells awful if you if you crush it. Pink, I've always aspired to have. I don't seem to manage to keep it for very long. So I'm afraid these are wild populations. But um, they're very short and there are quite a variety of, uh, a number of different species which are sold. They're not native, but similar size to that one. And as long as they're single flowers and they've got their pollen and they've got their nectar, it's going to fill the same sort of niche in the garden. Am I okay for time? Am I rabbiting on too long? Getting near the end, a few nods, we're okay, yeah, you know, still awake. Congratulations. <laughs> um, right, ponds. In one of my ponds, I have got the wild white water lily, which was pinched from the wild in the days when such things didn't seem to be quite so reprehensible. If anybody wants any, it's, it's there's rather a lot of it. Um, the wild white one, again, I like. It's not too big a flower. It's not too flamboyant. It's a very sweet little thing. I have to say it doesn't flower for as long as the cultivated ones that will come on a bit later and then last for the rest of the summer. But I like it. I, 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 again, I tend to like rather understated things rather than things that are just too jazzy. But having said that, the king cups are very um, flamboyant, really. And uh, I love that. I think, again, that is a really stunning thing. Very easy to grow. And um, it's quite a long flowering season. It also has the most stunning uh, capsules for its seeds. Just, it's amazing. Should have had a picture. Um, Water Avens is fine. Again, it's sort of thing you could walk past. It's got its wee nodding flowers, very sweet, lovely, subtle colour. Um, might not appeal to everyone. I just like it. And um, it doesn't make a nuisance of itself. But Marsh Sankfoil, whatever its current name is, I notice it's got a different one. I, I Again, it's a fantastic flower. Seems to be more sepal than anything else. I'm not sure if it has any petals, but um, it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. It might be it needs to grow in more acid water than my pond, but um, I'm afraid that's one that failed the test and I don't entertain it anymore. I do have bog bean as well, which again is a lovely, lovely, beautiful flower, but that can choke my pond solid and I'm all resolving not to have as much of it as I do, but um, I do still keep quite a bit. Um, flag irises, they grow very easily with me. Uh, in fact, just recently I've cut it back, or not cut it back, I climbed into the pond and with great difficulty um, managed to hack out a lot of it because it was about halfway across one bit of it. I didn't want it, but um, it's, it's good, it's lovely. Not a wildly long flowering season. I think it's a really nice thing. 
Raggy Robin, I would like to have it, but I haven't really succeeded. Oh, here we are with the bulb bean, yes. Um, amazing flowers, totally amazing flowers. I, I, I don't even know why they want to have flowers like that. It must be some wonderful reason. Maybe it keeps the flower warm or something, I don't know. But um, but certainly with me, that can grow a bit too vigorously and very fast. And um, uh, when, when my, my pond goes through cycles of uh, the, the native pond sort of gets totally choked up every so often and I just have to haul things out. But um, I always try and keep it to have a wee bit of that. Meadow sweet, I, I, unless I grew it in the pond, I have not really been very successful with. But again, it's a lovely, lovely flower. So, uh, well, I've, I've often referred to wildlife liking native plants nearly at the end now. And the reason is, of course, that all our native species have their insects that kind of belong to them. Things like moths with their long curled up tongues. They like to have plants that have nice long tubes they can get in down there and then got competition from other things. Unless you get bumblebees taking a wee shortcut and biting a hole in the side. But if you have a lot of native plants, then you are going to get a lot more wildlife in your garden, a lot more insects. And it's amazing what turns up. I was really pleased at my holly blues turning up. And you can spend a long while out in the garden seeing how many different kinds of bees you've got um, and solitary bees. And, and it just goes on and on and on. This is it's amazing what's out there. I used to go through a phase of putting out moth traps. And again, it's astounding and astonishing what's out there. And um, things that you wouldn't normally notice, especially if they're out at night. And it's lovely to feel that you're providing for them and providing for extra biodiversity. But remember, you don't absolutely have to have pure native ones. As long as you've got flowers that are single and they've got the nectar and they've got the pollen, uh, and that really often boils down to the old fashioned ones, then it does mean that you are going to be providing yourself with lots of pleasure, lots of color, lots of scent, but also lots of nectar and the pollen. And I do love a lawn with daisies. Don't you think that's stunning? I thought that was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> so um, that to me is a sort of garden. It's a, it's a mixture of the cultivated, obviously, because they cut the grass. But then when they cut the grass, this is a park at Dunbar, by the way. Um, when they cut the grass, they're just deadheading the daisies and it encourages the rest to come away. And um, there's, there's lots of room to squeeze in extra plants without really having to go terribly far out of your way. And even if folk just had more varied lawns, I think that would go quite a long way. So that's it. How do we get out? Stop share. Dee -dee. That's it. There we are. Get everyone back again. Right. There we are, folks. We are. Thank you very much, Heather. That was fascinating. I am already regretting having broadcast a lot of melancholy thistle <laughs> on my into my grassland. Wow. Um, this autumn, so I shall let you know <laughs> if it takes over. That's what sort of soil you've got. The trouble is my garden has been cultivated for, oh, I don't know how many years. Um, about nearly 200 years has been somebody growing something and putting in fertiliser. And um, that's the whole problem of trying to grow native things is you're not really providing native soil, are you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's uh, mine is uh, no, no, hasn't been cultivated for that long, but it has been cultivated. It was a field at one point. Mm. Uh, mine is totally uncultivated. <laughs> Tess and I live in the shores of, of above the shores of the Gabuli Firth, so parts of our garden are very sandy, parts mm. of them are alluvial, yeah, and uh, parts of them are quite acidy. So it's quite it's quite hard to find. You know, there's not oh, kind of one. Thing one type of soil yeah but i've got most of those things i've got i've found in the garden but i'm not sure you could say i was growing them because they kind of come and go but i was going to ask you if you grow that your plant do you grow tend to grow your native plants from seed in seed trees and rather than just i find that much more successful 
um, if you put things out, well, obviously some things like the euphrasia, the you know, the eye bright and yellow rattle, you would have to sew them direct. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you sew them in a tray or something and, and prick them out and grow them on, I think you're more likely to get more. I mean, if, if you just broadcast them, you might get two or three coming up. Whereas mm -hmm. if you sew them in a tray, you'll get hundreds probably. But... Uh, Though you do always have to allow for the fact they might have to be chilled for a winter or something. So mm -hmm. you might sow them and think nothing happens. Um, so there's always that element. But um, I do think it's more successful to sow things and, and plant them out, except, as I say, the foxes always want to dig them up again with me. So mm -hmm. there's that. And in that sense, sowing straight into the grass would be more successful because the foxes wouldn't notice. Yes. But... Um, yeah, I, I would go for and, and and also for making grassland, they often recommend plug plants, don't they? Buying mm -hmm. things and putting it out. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yes. Oh well I'll, I'll let you know about the mm -hmm. this as time goes on. Yes. I presume you'd like to you take questions from Oh of from... course, absolutely. Yes, yes. So has anyone like got a question that they have for Heather? I, I haven't got a question, but I've got an observation, which is that yes. I totally agree with what you said about blackthorn. I, I planted blackthorn in the hedges around the garden and thought, oh, that'll be lovely. I have flowers and then I have slow gin and, you know, in the autumn. And my goodness me, it's coming up in the vegetable plots. It's coming up in the greenhouse. It's coming up inside the polytunnel. It's coming oh, up yeah. on the patio and that great big leathery sort of creeping um, <laughs> you know, suckers that are really, you have to get a mattock to them to get them out. And so I would say if you're going to well, have blackthorn plant it, you know, like inside a buried old dustbin or something where it can't escape from, I, yeah. I regret having, well, I don't totally regret because we do get some slow gin, but, you know, <laughs> such a nuisance. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I... Um... And I know even at the Botanic Garden, for example, they're always monitoring anything that's planted, particularly in the more regional gardens that are right on top of more native habitats. In Edinburgh, at least, we've got a bit of a barrier with the, the city round about the garden. But um, if anything shows signs of growing too vigorously and seeding itself adjacently, it does tend to get taken out again. Yes, I didn't plant sweet Sicily in my garden. It was just there but it's every it's awful you just well it, it looks lovely but you just it can't is, get rid of it i know just what you mean yes i'm <laughs> yeah. silence i was going to say sweet cecily is nice to eat as well i have like it in salads oh but, yes absolutely yeah but i love these things you can turn to good account <laughs> You can eat wild garlic as well, of course. I mean, not, not just the, the non native one that's a nuisance, but um, I'm sure lots of things you can eat. You can eat hazel come to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've got lots of wild garlic pesto in the freezer that I made in the spring. Really? Yeah. It's, I, just, my, I grow the garlic to, to eat. Mm. <laughs> I want the, the wild garlic. Anyone else? Any comments or questions for? For Heather, are we all just getting our trowels ready and going to rush out to the to the garden when the frost goes and the spring begins? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For that. Yana? Uh, I was wondering about uh, shorter lawns. We to to get daisies in the lawn, you really have to cut it quite frequently, but uh, we don't like to do that. And we've had a lot of success with white clover. Ooh. And it means you only need to cut the lawn maybe four, three, four, or possibly five times a year. And you cut it when the clover flowers are starting to go over and they all pop up again. You, you have to get, it's better to get wild type because the, the cultivated type white clover does tend to take over. But um, it's been very yeah. successful. But, 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 but mind you, we're at, we're at, 200 metres and the Cairngorms and a lot of the things you've suggested I've said oh that won't grow here, that won't grow here, that won't grow here so we, we are it's uh -huh. more difficult Yes I do have a lot of white clover in my well lawn, grass whatever you want to call it 
Um, it's just a very, very short one that just has always been there. And um, I think that is part of why my grass doesn't need much cutting. And it stays green when it's very dry as well. So it's, it's ideal for our droughty kind of springs that we get. Yes, the, the very dry year, was it too, not not last <laughs> summer or the summer before, but the summer before that, I think. Yeah. And we, we cut our grass twice, I think, but it stayed yeah. green for the whole summer <laughs> with the clover. Hmm. I'm kind of assuming everybody that's listening are, do have gardens. Is this theoretical for some people, or do most people try to have some sort of native things sticking around? I mean, you don't have to have native things at all. But um, I, I think, well, yeah, I just like to have them around there, mm. just tucked away in odd corners or nothing else. Mm. Uh, somebody did say, how did I grow mine? And, and I must admit, quite a few things came home from the Botanic Garden because when we were growing things for conservation purposes, it's very educational to bring them home and <laughs> um, have them. One thing I do have is the pyramidal ajuga, ajuga pyramidalis, if that's its common name. And um, that, funnily enough, which I think always been a wee bit special, and you don't find it everywhere, is, I wouldn't say it's a weed or anything, but I'd learned that it likes to move around a lot. The plants are not very long-lived, and it just keeps popping up, popping up. And it's a lovely wee thing again. And by growing these native plants, you do learn quite a lot about them. So um, that's, that's quite a useful thing as well. I was just gonna say thank you. That was really helpful. Um, I'm back in Australia at the moment in Canberra tonight or today. And um, we have a little garden behind a, a little flat in Inverness and we're there for five months of the year over sort of early summer and into autumn so and I've been trying to grow mostly native things it's very tiny and I love the way you were saying you sort of had all these fantasies about your garden so I have these grand fantasies that there's a woodland corner and a fern corner and a, a, the flowers against the border against the wall and <laughs> but when we did move in in the June it was wonderful because there were um there was um, an elder flowering and mm. um, climbing hydrangea and a white yeah, rose along one, the fence. Yeah. So you, yeah, you've inspired me yet again for when we come over this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, elder's excellent because it's good nectar and it's good flowers and it's good for berries. Quite big and shading, mind you. Yeah. Anything? Anyone else get anything to to say or ask? Yeah. I was, I've been uh, toying with the idea of having an umbellifer collection, but I wonder if that's a very bad mistake before I get started. Um, just that I had some fool's parsley turned up in the garden. I thought it's really lovely. It's really, really nice. It's beautiful leaf and, you know, lots of insects on it. I thought, oh, I could have an umbellifer collection. I could have that. And, but I think somebody mentioned Sweet Sicily was a bit of a thug. So. Yes, I would think most of them would be rather spready. Yeah, I can't think that. Trying to be like big nuts, um, but it's a bit small and I'm not getting it going very well. No. But no. Uh, hey, well, you don't. We don't want. Um, hmm, there's quite a few things you don't want. <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe yeah. Maybe it's like yeah. I I, I, I grow yeah, angelica in the room. Yeah. Um, Vicar's Mead near my pond and that sells seeds but not so that it's a problem and it's quite attractive and it's not quite as big as the sort of wild angelica I don't think or well, not when it's growing in my garden anyway I, I, I grow the big, big angelica and also hogweed and you'd think they'd be very invasive but quite honestly there are so many moths and butterflies and caterpillars and other creatures that eat both it's actually very difficult to grow you know you you, you get you get it going one year and the next year all the seeds are eaten and you have to wait two years till it comes yeah. again oh i found that the edible angelica again you know it's six foot tall but once you've got it you can't get rid of it <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's up in all sorts of places hmm. 
Has anyone has anyone tried Lovage? I kind of fancy Lovage, but I yes, don't... yes. Again, it's big, but it's yeah. That's me. It, it's big, but it stays stays put. More yeah. or less. It would be too invasive. I can't imagine it really. Yeah. Well, the possibility. One. <laughs> you know, one. <laughs> yeah, it's statuesque. I think yes. that's what you'd say. Yeah. About six well, foot tall. Okay. I saw, I saw a lovage in somebody some somewhere or other. It was it was flowering beautifully and it was absolutely covered in bees. Huh. Do you so think it was Scotch lovage or, or the natives? I mean or, or the culinary one? I don't know. It was a big thing. Oh, isn't that just the that's the sort of cultivated one, isn't it? Is it? Well, it, may, it may well have been, yes. Um <laughs> I was thinking the Scots one, which is small, well, it's smaller and it grows on rocks by the seaside. What it does in gardens, I'm afraid I don't know. All right. Well, this thing was, you know, it's over six feet tall. Oh, ah, the one that they I mean, sell, which I don't, well, I don't think it's native around here anyway. Yeah, oh. native somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, I might give that a shot if people. Yeah. Well, any more? Anyone else want to report on anything they're growing in their garden? Because that would be interesting to know. I've, I've started trying to grow thymes and sage. And they, they're very successful. The bees love them, of course. Mm. Oh, yeah, I've got wood sage, mm. um, which grows very well. And I've got just the ordinary little short thyme, uh, whatever it's called now. And um, I've got a lot of that in my sort of rock garden -y area. In fact, it spreads almost a bit too enthusiastically and gets a haircut every so often. <laughs> but uh, it is stunning when it's flowering, absolutely gorgeous. And oh, as you say, the bees, yeah. Prunella seems to take very well to our soil. Ah, <laughs> interesting. Okay, so I'm think... low altitude light soil. All right, sorry, Kathy, are you going to say something again? No? Oh, I thought you were waving your hand. I was just <laughs> batting the mosquitoes away, were you? <laughs> uh, we're, we're trying lamb's lugs. And uh, I know there's two kinds of lamb's lugs. One just has leaves and one has flowers on it. Uh, a lot of the cultivars just have the leaves. But yes. it's absolutely phenomenal for bees, especially solitary bees. Ooh. And uh, I've put in a lot more. And uh, the, the the second lot I got said firmly on each plant, this does not flower. But so did the stuff I put in before, and that's flowered beautifully. So oh, I'm hoping sweet. this is the same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was some they had at the Botanic Garden that um, carder bees, is that right? Where there was, there was a new species for Scotland that suddenly popped up on it, sort of harvesting the woolly stuff. Oh, uh, wool carder bees. Yes, we don't yeah. we don't get those, of course. No, but, well, but, a bit more climate change, and it might arrive on Europe. Yeah, but but that would be fantastic. That yeah. that's my ambition. Mm. Well, this is it. You see, if you provide the habitat, you're you're going to have things popping up, and um, so, so a lot of these things are nothing wildly special about them, and not that difficult to grow. But it's amazing what comes with them. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much for your time. Here. Thanks very much for your time, Heather. It's been really interesting listening to you, and I'm going to watch with interest what actually germinates from the about twenty varieties of wildflowers I I sowed this autumn, and see whether any melancholy thistle grow, whether ever any pignut grow, or the myriad number of things I I put in. Sounds interesting. Yes. Yes. I've been. I've been. Um, because I a grassland that's been thick with yellow rattle for the last three years to try and get that grass down. So it's now the opportunity to to flourish for the native plants. But we're also going to see, just to let people know, we're also going to see Heather in person later on this year. Heather is leading a fern walk in the Big Burn and Golspie in August. I uh, remember last year she did a fantastic talk about identifying ferns well she's come out in person to, to show us what they are and help answer our questions so really looking forward to that Heather thanks very much for I mean, to do that and hopefully a number of us will make the trip uh, up to Goldsby 
to mm -hmm. to take part. Yeah. Um, can oh, I be seeing you in person? <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. I've just got a couple of announcements to, to make, just to say that the next talk we've got is on the 13th of February, and it's Rachel Murphy from the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. And she's going to be talking about uh, citizen science um, and monitoring change through citizen science. So hopefully we might get some information to encourage us to continue with the, the botany square that we've got uh, at Lerney. We've also also received this morning into your email box from Tessa and Audrey the latest copy of Notes and News, and it gives the field trips that we've got planned so far this year. And if any of you have a favourite place you'd like to visit, or even better, would like to volunteer to organise a field trip to somewhere, then get in touch with me or one of the other committee members. And... Uh, we can put it onto the, the programme. So thanks very much everyone for tonight. Uh, it's been a fascinating talk and a great turnout uh, in whether we probably wouldn't any of us have crossed the doorstep. <laughs> um, certainly up here, I don't know what it's like down with you, but up here it's minus four and thick mist, certainly in Inverness or outside Inverness. Minus eight here. Yeah. My, well, there you go. <laughs> the Cairngorms can always tr trump us, can't they? <laughs> Above freezing in Merseyside. No <laughs> snow. <laughs> Above <laughs> freezing. <laughs> That's not winter. Yeah, I, I think it might be going up to 28 where we are at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. mm.